Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Monday Movie Club. This is a new series where we have some friends come on. Uh, we pick a movie and then we talk about it. Um, I know we've all been feeling a little down and lonely since quarantine started. So I thought it would be a good idea to try to bring back some sense of community. And for me, one of the biggest uh, community formers in my life has been movies. Uh, so each week I will uh, bring on a different guest. They will pick a movie for the two of us to watch. We will both watch it in the comfort and safety of quarantine, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Um, at the end of every episode, I will tell you what movie uh, we will be watching next, and then um, you can come back and have a little chat with us virtually. Um, if you can't watch the movie before you come and join us, that's okay. We'll try to keep this thing as spoiler-free as possible so that you can maybe learn about some other movies that you might want to watch while you're stuck in quarantine. Uh, but enough talking about it, let's just jump straight into it. Our first movie for our very first week, um, I don't know if you can guess what it is, it's a little known movie from a distant year of 2017. It's Lady Bird. And here to talk about it, uh, our very first guest, a good friend of mine, an amazing actor, singer, dancer, and all around amazing person with her own YouTube channel that you should go check out. It's Rosie Dean. Rosie, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. I'm very excited. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming on and being my first guest. Um, before we jump into anything uh, movie related, Rosie, I just want to ask you, I just want to do like a general check-in. Like, how are you doing? How is quarantine treating you? Are you staying healthy? Are you staying safe? Are you staying sane? Uh, how are you? I am hanging in there, Kieran. <laughs> um, I'm watching a lot of movies, which is yeah. good. And I love that we are actors because we can count it as research. <laughs> um, and technically we are doing the work by yes. living out of watching movies. It's I'm, not lazy. I'm, it's not lazy. No, it's important exactly. work. Yes. yes. Um, I'm not taking notes or anything, but it's all in here. Um, I, I normally don't take notes, but I figure since I've seen the movie before and I'm hosting a thing, I actually for the first time tried to take notes while watching a movie. Oh no, you're going to know it's, so much more than I do. No, don't worry. I can't read my own handwriting. So I, I see the words Howard Zinn, and I think I know what that meant. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm doing well, though. I'm trying to exercise and um, trying to get out of bed before noon every day. So yeah. that's I mean, being unemployed is weird because we've, I'm sure, both been working and on the grind for so long that now yeah. this kind of feels very strange. It is. I was talking to this about my parents a few days ago. Um, since I was legally able to work, even technically a little before that, because um, I was working for my grandparents, I have worked. Um, and if I wasn't working directly in like a job sense, I was in college or being an RA, which is work. <laughs> so it's the first time I've ever taken a pause and I liked it for about the first two days. <laughs> yeah. And then I got antsy. A hundred percent. It's hard because this is such an amazing time to be making our own content, especially with something like YouTube. But it, for some reason, is so hard to create that structure for yourself. Yeah. Um, so I really admire that you are getting this series going and I'm excited to see where it goes. Let's let's start talking about movies, Rosie. Uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, but before we get into Lady Bird specifically, I just have like one or two questions for you, uh, just kind of about movies in general. The first one being, what, if there's any, is the first movie you remember seeing in theaters? Okay, I'm sure this wasn't the first one. Mm. But the first one I remember was Stuart Little 2. <laughs> yes. Not the um, first one. <laughs> no, not the first one. I'm sure I saw the first one. The first one I really remember was Stuart Little 2. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing that little bird in that little aviator cap and thinking, wow, 
this is the field I want to go into. I want to make art like this. Yes. I mean, I, uh, similarly to you, although your, your memory must be earlier than mine, because I know for a fact that the first movie I saw in theaters was Toy Story 2, but I don't remember that. Um, okay. My memory of going to the movies is actually much later. Maybe it's just because it was a large impact. It was uh, Chamber of Secrets. That's the first oh. movie I remember seeing in theaters. That's a scary one for a first big screen experience. Yeah. Um, just a strange thing about me. I was, I was afraid of Ursula the Sea Witch. I was afraid of the hyenas from Lion King. So my parents didn't want to take me to see uh, Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone in theaters when it came out. But then I saw it on VHS and for some reason, I wasn't scared. I what, loved it. You already read it? Um, my mom had read it to me, although my, I was so young that I didn't remember it. Mm. Like seeing Sorcerer's Stone is the first true memory of Harry Potter I have. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Because that movie's pretty scary for kids too. Oh yeah, the face burning thing, the three-headed dog. Yeah, a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, so is there, um, so Stuart Little 2, big impact on you. You remember it clearly, you wanted to go oh, yeah. into the field. Um, is there any movie other than Stuart Little 2 that stands out above the others in your childhood as like a big influence on your love of movies? Yes, 100%. Um, my first PG-13 movie in theaters, Oh, The Dark Knight. The Dark I, Knight. Yes, I begged my dad to take me and I, I must have been like 10 or 11 at the time. And he was like, I don't know, I've heard <laughs> pretty scary. <laughs> no, 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 I really want to go. So he took me, obviously, because I wasn't 13 yet. Um, my parents were very strict about letting me see movies, you know, when the ratings recommended people see them. Right. So I didn't really watch PG-13 until I was around that age anyway. But my dad took me. And I remember the only thing that really scared me was the pencil moment. But oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I literally loved it. I think to this day, though, it kind of is recognized as one of the greatest movies of all time. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so many in my top 10 for sure. Top five for them. But yeah, it was just an insane experience. I think like the cinematography, the tone of the entire thing, the acting, that's <laughs> what really made me sit back and be like, wow, I want to be an actor more than anything in the world because the things that these people did you you have a um you have a better uh actor influence than i do i will admit while harry potter again is probably the thing that made me want to be an actor mm -hmm. um the the biggest actor influence for me growing up is jim carrey and i know that's not like fine acting until later in his career when he started doing like truman show and eternal sunshine um, but Jim Carrey's rubber face is, I was like, yes, that. Jim Carrey is incredible. He's, it's just a different kind of acting, isn't it? It is. But it's, it's no less important. It's incredible and it makes people happy. And that's another huge part of ours. I mean, you can do serious things that are scary and impactful, but you can also do funny things that make people smile. So that's incredible. I love Jim Carrey. I think he's incredible. Let's start talking about Lady Bird. Um, First question, why'd you pick Lady Bird? Oh gosh, it's <laughs> one of my favorite movies literally of all time. I, as a person striving to get into the entertainment industry full time as my livelihood, I find it so inspiring to see a film that's led by women and is about, you know, two females experiencing something that, I don't know, I mean, is never really talked about. Mother-daughter relationships are never really talked about in the complexities of them. And it was just so inspiring for me to see that. I have a very unique relationship with my mother. So to see something not exact to it, but with certain parallels that I'd never seen on screen before, on the screen was very exciting. And like, I don't know, made me feel like I wasn't alone. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, um, totally. Um, it's funny you bring that up because when I was doing some like note researching uh, on the movie outside, there's a couple things that stand out from like what the experience that you're describing um, is exactly. And I don't think that's a secret at all. 
Um, that's exactly what Greta Gerwig was uh, going for. She talked about wanting to have a coming of age story like Boyhood and Moonlight in the two years prior for women. Uh, and I also, I didn't know this part though, apparently her working title for the movie was Mothers and Daughters. Really? Yeah, I did not know that, but there you have it. <laughs> huh, I didn't know that either. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, that's like at the root of it, that's what it is. Um, and that's so special. I love that. I also appreciate it because um, growing up, I was always the more dramatic person in my family. Um, and anytime I would express emotions, I, I grew up in a British household, so it was never really encouraged. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I loved seeing someone who was as much of a drama queen as I was, and that being celebrated. Well, <laughs> made fun of and, you know, Made fun of and celebrated, commented on. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought it was great to see someone like myself represented. And not only represented, but, but she ends up, you know, going on a very meaningful journey to self-discovery. And she ends yeah. up out on top. And it just was wonderful to see. And she goes to um, a little unknown school that you and I know nothing about. Nothing about. I know this movie only came out. Uh, like three years ago, right? Mm. But I still want to ask, um, has revisiting the movie changed how you see it at all? Like, does anything new stand out uh, as you watch it now, as opposed to when it was out in theaters? Yes, actually. I just can't remember what. I remember I watched it, because I watched it last week with my parents. Mm -hmm. And I remember this time around, you know what it was? What? It was this time around, I not only resonated, well, this time around, like, Lady Bird's story resonated with me, but the mother's side of it resonated with mm -hmm. me too, which was something that I did not get the first time. The first time I saw it, I was so involved and invested in everything that, like, the kid was going through. But this time around, my heart just broke so much harder for the mom. And I don't know why that is because I'm only 22 and like not a mom. <laughs> I don't have children. I, I think it might just be that I either have come further in my relationship with my mother mm -hmm. in working to understand each other and working through conflicts. Um, and it also might just be that I'm a little bit older and a little bit more mature and can kind yeah. of be more empathetic for people who aren't in situations like my own. Yeah, I just... The whole thing just hit me so much harder the second time around. It was crazy. For sure. That, that's sort of like me where, um, you know, I used to never, ever cry at movies aside from like when Alfred in The Dark Knight Rises is like, I'm sorry, I failed you. Like that's, that was it. Um, <laughs> but as I've gotten older, every little thing makes me cry in movies. And I think it's just like, as you get older, that empathy does like grow to like an almost unhealthy extent, at least in my case, where I'm like, oh no, she stubbed her toe. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> like it, it really, every little thing gets me. Because this movie is so great, I want to make sure we get some time to talk about what makes this movie great. Because I mean, it has a 94 Metacritic score it was nominated for five Oscars. It won two Golden Globes, including Best Musical or Comedy. Not to mention it's personally in my top 100 movies of all time. So for me, it really boils down to like three bullet points on what makes it great and kind of three people as well. There's the acting, specifically coming from Laurie Metcalf and Saoirse Ronan the directing and the script both coming from Greta Gerwig. Um, so let's start with, let's start with the acting and just what really stands out to you about the acting, Saoirse Ronan's and Laurie Metcalf's Golden Globe nominated performances. Uh, well, Saoirse's just a queen, isn't she? So is Laurie Metcalf. They're both such powerhouses. And the thing I love about, especially Saoirse Ronan is, um, she just like throws herself into characters. Like the melodrama of Lady Bird is so humorous 
to the outsider, but to her, you could tell that it was so real. Like she was, what she was like upset about. I I literally can't even remember the things she gets upset about are so ridiculous. But to her, it's like the end of the world, and I think that that is so incredible wow. the way that she's able to portray that. I also love Beanie Feldstein in mm. this movie. I think she's so adorable and she yes. does such a good job of supporting her friend but then at the same time understanding what she deserves as a friend in return yeah. and that's such an interesting thing to grapple with especially as a supporting character she had such strong points of view on everything that is really really difficult especially like you know when you're making a film it's not done chronologically. It's not done. It, it, making a film is so difficult to keep your character's continuity um, in line. And everybody in this movie just did such a good job with their arcs and their growth and their yeah. Lucas Hedges. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and this is sort of overlapping with acting and script. But I had some like interesting notes about the portrayal of a lot of the um, secondary. Uh, adult figures in the movie mm. and how this movie clearly is supposed to be told from Lady Bird's point of view because the adults in this movie are largely segmented, segregated into, aside from her parents, just like they suck or they're awesome. Because there's, <laughs> there's the math teacher who is mean to her and like kind of creepily flirting with her best friend. And I was like, never okay with that. <laughs> um, like, I like Jules. I'm going to call you Jules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or um, what about, uh, I think he only shows up like once, but there was something I just didn't like about him, which is funny because I love the actor. But the one who plays the, the soon to be stepfather of the best friend, the one who's David Wallace on The Office. Mm -hmm. he's in like one scene and something about me I was like I don't I don't jive with him yeah and clearly neither, neither did Lady Bird and then you have the priest who is the theater teacher yeah his his little tiny little story line also stood out a lot more to me this time around yeah um, and then probably my favorite secondary adult character like the main nun what a legend <laughs> <laughs> the fact that she finds the prank that Lady Bird plays on her hilarious and like yeah. doesn't punish her rocks. <laughs> oh, and you know, you know the part that I find so funny. And I guess this is like a spoiler, but it doesn't matter. Spoiler going warning. off of that. Going off of that. When um when she's talking to the guidance counselor about um about what school she wants to go to and she's like well this one this one this one but I I don't know if I could get into those and then the guy laughs. Like, you definitely couldn't get it <laughs> she she laughs in her face like okay I understand guidance counselors should set realistic expectations and she can say like look with your grades you are not getting into Yale like a, a comforting but the fact that she like laughs in her face when she says it and again like part of me wonders is this supposed to be told from her point of view and maybe the guidance counselor in real, in real life, I know it's a movie, but in real life didn't laugh at her face. That's just how Lady Bird felt, you know? I've never thought about that before. It all being told sort of through the lens of Lady Bird, but that all makes so much more sense to me now because every single character is such an extremely committed version <laughs> of that, what that person would be in real life. Like, Beanie Feldstein is the most humble, little, cute, little yeah. best friend like, no person would ever be that cute, but she is. And then, like, Timothy Chalamet's character, Kyle, he is just the extreme of that, like, stoner boy who... That's, that's what the Howard Zinn was. He was the first... Her introduction to Timothy Chalamet's character, Kyle, he is reading Howard Zinn's the, uh, the People's History of the United States. And I'm like, of course you are. And yeah. you're definitely not getting it. Because, like, all of the little things he says about, like, the governments are soon going to be putting trackers in our brains. Like, you don't, you're not fully getting the books that you're reading. And he goes, he goes, I don't, I try not to participate in the economy. 
I'm trying you're to get rich. on trading and bartering. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, yeah he's, he says, I don't care about money. And I'm like, well, that's coming from somebody who is extremely well off and only spends time with people that are, or he at least believes to be, extremely well off. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, just... Yeah, he, I hate him. <laughs> yeah, but like everyone is such an extreme. Of, they are. It's just, it's so funny that. That's how it feels in high I've school. Too. That. That's how it feels. Yeah. In high and, and what I think, this is sort of moving into like the directorial Perfect. aspect, but something that I feel like Lady Bird achieved so well, and this is fully due to Greta Gerwig, I would assume, is that every character was in the same world to like the nth degree. Yeah. And that's hard to, it's hard to do because when you watch it, it doesn't feel supernaturalistic. It doesn't, like people don't really react to things exactly the way they do in this movie. No, it's it's like the, while the dialogue is very realistic, overlapping that whole, style almost like a almost like a play yeah um, with like some of her roots uh the 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 acting style is heightened realistic dialogue Mm -hmm. heightened acting yeah but it's so uniform throughout and i think that's so incredible for a director to be able to convey that to their actors this is what i want and obviously do so much work with each individual person to make sure that everyone's on the same page and everybody molds so well together Oh, because then it makes all those arguments and all of the fights between like Miguel and Shelley and Lady Bird and all of that. Like Miguel, Miguel and Shelley too are like such heightened versions of what those people would be. Like the yeah. piercings. In and the, the exact you know, same place. When they're like, oh, yeah. the, the piercings are in the same exact places. They're like a couple who literally do everything together. Like they're just a unit. And it's just, it's so funny. Um, and, and just, yeah, every everything because of the how heightened everybody is on the same level though the conflicts are so juicy and explosive and it's just mm, like there's so many different people interacting in one movie and every combination has a different evokes a different feeling or a different outcome and it's just mm, love it love it it's it's awesome too because um this was Greta Gerwig's first solo outing as a feature director Uh and it's like similar to like a Jordan Peele situation, like just knocked it out of the park. Um, So we've covered some of, some of the awesome things. Um, I just, I just want to get your thoughts on a few of the things that I uh, wrote down at this point. Uh, First of all, number one thing, spoiler warning, she ends up going to NYU where Rosie and I both attended schools. And I noticed this in theaters and I noticed it again this time, they nailed the dorm room of NYU. <laughs> I know, dude, I was like, at first I wasn't entirely sure where she was going. She could have ended up at like the new school or something. It's kind of in our area. But the second she was unpacking in her room, I was like, yep, <laughs> there That's we are. Annoying. And and part of me wonders, I'm like, did they did they film in a dorm? I don't know, I couldn't find that online anywhere. Yeah. Um, because I know that that's happened before. Um, Jessica Jones did that when it was on. It filmed it in an NYU dorm. And they had the same, like, shitty drawers that we have. The same that, bed, the, sa- the same chair. Like, everything is identical. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I know that some dorms have, like, similar things across different universities. However, the view was the same. And not every place has those same shitty drawers that are in every desk, in every side table. The same drawers. The Part same. of me feels like they had to have filmed it in a dorm because, I mean, like, what was what would the point have been to yeah, I, completely too. replicate an NYU dorm just for the few people out there that are gonna recognize that that's an NYU dorm? Like, I don't think they would have put that much. Up. I know, and and they clearly were filming in that area because there was some shots by Washington Square Park. There were shots by that church that's on uh, Broadway, and you even see. A girl that I, I'm like, was that an extra or was that a kid late to class? There's a girl in a purple NYU hoodie that like runs in the far background. And I'm like, I think that's just someone late to class. Um, the other funny thing, still on the same topic, so I can keep the same spoiler. Um, 
when I first saw this movie, I was actually doing a co-event with another RA friend of mine to take a bunch of people to go see Lady Bird. Um, and there's the scene, different spoiler, but still spoiler tag, where she gets majorly drunk and ends up in the hospital. And me and my RA friend, when that happened, just turned to each other and we're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like we don't take- so funny. But even any age that you have to take care of, we're like, that RA must have been pissed. That's, that's move-in week, which is the oh. worst week for that. Did you have to deal with that a lot? Oh yeah, I, I can't give specifics because that's not right. But I had students who had seizures that I had to take care of. I had students who were like beyond drunk and I was like worried. And you have to get in the ambulance with them. You stay with them until the doctor says that they're okay and they're just like sleeping it out. Um, and then you have to get permission from the resident too. So you need doctor's permission and you need resident's permission. It's terrible. I have a question for you about this movie that it's a layer that I can't relate to in any way really because I wasn't raised particularly religiously. I was yeah. raised Anglican, but it was more a social thing than anything. And when mm. we moved, we didn't go to church. So um, you were raised Catholic, yes? I was. I did not go to a Catholic school. I went to a public school. I went to a very nice public school though. They, they talk about her public school being one where someone got stabbed outside of. Now, while that has happened in bordering towns, and sure, my school has had its fair share of problems, it's a very good public school. But I was raised Catholic. I went to Sunday school. I got confirmed. The whole shebang. So the sort of overarching message of her, like, straying from her religion, but then sort of in the end coming back to it as a place of comfort, can you relate to that in any way? Or I, I think it's an aspect of a story that a lot of people have gone through and because it's supposed to be a story that everyone can find something in um i i think i think it's there because i i do i know a lot of people especially at nyu who went to catholic schools didn't really jive too much but then they started going to church every sunday when they got here because uh, it, it gives you a sense of community and nostalgia for home. And I don't, I'm not sure that her journey at the end of the movie is implied that she's going back to religion. Yeah. No, um, I, think I, I think it's more that she is longing for that sense of community that she had and now has to rebuild. Um, and she's probably considering if it's an aspect of her life that she wants to keep or not the religious part. Um, cause she has to choose a new name for herself. She kind of chooses a new birthplace. She, she starts claiming other things when she realizes no one cares about Sacramento. Um, she invents a whole new personality for herself. Like a lot of people do in college. And then the last, the last like quote, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it exactly. Cause I think the essence of it is, is more powerful than how it's said in the movie. Um, I think it's amazing that they talk about there's, is there really a difference between love and attention? And you realize the whole time the mom, even if she's yelling at her, she's giving her more attention than anybody else because she loves her endlessly. And even when we think that she's holding back some of that attention towards the end, she is giving her more attention than ever, constantly writing to her, constantly on her mind. Uh, and the idea that is there anything more loving than attention? I love that. And you're so right. The, I mean, the whole ending with the letters, is it's so beautiful. And the dad throughout, I love, I love the dad's character throughout and how he just kind of, he's like a little fairy godmother. He's just kind of always there to yeah. put the little pieces together. <laughs> yeah. Make sure everybody gets along and it's just, like what he does for her with the with the um, financial aid and everything and yeah. Yeah, I mean he, they talk about refinancing a house. Um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's it's awesome and I, and I agree the whole and I think a, a, a great way to wrap this up is talking about um, the ending to this movie. Um, 
from the moment that she's driving her off to college, she doesn't all that stuff and kind of spoiler warning, but also at the same time, I don't think this movie can really be spoiled for you on like a comic book movie or anything like that. Like the movie exists and it is good all the way through, but there's a beautiful shot of just the mom driving away and you watch Laurie Metcalf give a beautiful performance. And then we see the two of them kind of reconnecting while still missing that connection. Um, and it's a movie that if you're not already with your parents because of quarantine right now, it makes you be like, I gotta call my mom. I had a very similar experience to Lady Bird in that last scene when I was a freshman in college. I, I went to yoga to the people <laughs> um, with my roommate and yoga is a very, you know, relaxing, enlightening experience. Very so I came out of yoga to the people and I called my dad <laughs> and I was like, dad, hi. I just want to let you know that I am so grateful <laughs> for everything that you have done to allow me to be where I am. I am growing so much as a person and I think you would be really proud of who I'm becoming. And I just want to say, I love you and thank you. <laughs> and then he literally texted me, like he got the voicemail and then he texted me like, are you high? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just grateful on life <laughs> it was so funny but I, I, again like it was very dramatic and I, when I saw that in the movie I was like me <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I, I think I think it's a it's, it's a beautiful movie for those of you who haven't seen the movie yet you should definitely go check it out um it is free if you have Amazon Prime um, if you don't have Amazon Prime it is free not free to rent but it is cheap to rent for like three bucks on uh, iTunes, Amazon, and all of those movie rental places. Um, I, def I definitely recommend you go check it out if you haven't already. And if you have, give it a rewatch. It's worth a rewatch. Um, what else are you doing while you're in quarantine? Um, now, Rosie, before we uh, wrap this up, do you have anything that you would like to plug or any last minute things you wanna share with the audience? If you want to talk to me about movies, message me on Instagram. Um, if you want to check out my YouTube channel, um, link will be in the description. Will it, Kieran? Yes, link will be in, in the description. <laughs> okay, cool. And make sure you subscribe to Kieran because he's a great guy who's got some great content coming. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you agree with us, disagree with us, does this place on your top movies of all time? Personally, for me, if I recall correctly, it's somewhere around 76 for me, top movies of all time. Um, yes, I am that diligent with where I place my movies. Can you uh, release the full list? I'm so curious. I have, I have a top 100 list, yeah, and I change it I every year. It. What? Uh, I want to see it. Can you I, release it somewhere? I will, I will send it, I'll send it to you and hey, maybe let me know in the comments below if you want me to do a video recapping my personal top 100 movies of all time. But every Monday I will be posting one of these videos. If you want to talk to me about uh, a movie, if you have a movie that you really want to talk about, uh, shoot me a DM, um, let me know and we'll see what we can arrange. We have some uh, great guests coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Next week, we will be watching Tucker and Dale versus Evil. It's a movie I haven't seen. My good friend John Blair is going to be here with us talking about it. Uh, so please come and watch that. Thanks for spending this time with us. Uh, be sure to give a like and subscribe. And thanks, guys. Go watch Lady Bird. Bye.